Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today at the beginning of this session with our first keynote. I'm uh, Joan Marek. I am a, a member of the uh, IW3C2. You heard about it earlier today with Wendy at the plenary session. And I'm um, a member of, uh, now of the new ACM steering committee of the conference. In my day job, I also serve as a vice president of research for Alexa Shopping at Amazon. And today I'm absolutely honored and, and more than delighted to introduce uh, our first keynote speaker, Prabhakar Raghavan. Uh, Prabhakar is a senior vice president at Google. He leads, let me get it right, Google Search, Assistant, Geo, Ads, Commerce, and Payments. I hope I didn't forget anything. It's absolutely incredible, impressive list. And imagine the number of, of users his teams impact worldwide, just incredible. He's also an ACM and an IEEE fellow and a member of the National Academy of Engineering. He holds a PhD from UC Berkeley and a Bachelor of Technology from the Indian Institute of Technology in Madras. Prabhakar, you know, many of you are familiar with the conference, knows him, know him, is an eminent figure in computer science and in search and web technologies in particular. He authored two textbooks on search that I recommend that you read, still very relevant. He published extensively at multiple conferences, including, of course, this one. And actually, while at Yahoo prior to joining Google, he published with uh, his co-author a paper about the graph structure in the web. Uh, if you remember, you might, you might remember it as the Bowtie paper. And it was, at this, it was published at you know, the web conference, and it won uh, the Test of Time Award in 2017. Um, as you see, you know, a long story of Prabhaka with this conference, but uh, allow me also to share some personal, pers personal perspective I could not resist because Prabhaka and I are actually very linked to this conference together. Uh, you know, very personal anecdote uh, at the 2009 conference in Madrid, I was working for Google and serving at uh, uh, as PC chair and I don't really remember Prabhaka, but there at the conference you convinced me to jump boats and to leave uh, Google for Yahoo. And you actually also convinced me, uh, uh, you know, at another conference of this series, to um, to run for your seat at the IW3C2 uh, uh, conference. So I owe you a, a lot for this conference. Um, I know that Prabhakar strongly supported the move of this conference to ACM. So it's only only natural, and maybe maybe, maybe even auspicious. I want to believe that is now the first keynote of the first instance of this ACM conference. Apologies of the, you know, for the long intro, but this is really, really a unique opportunity to rec recognize the unique contribution of Prabhakar to this series. So without further ado, please listen to him. Uh, you will learn a ton, and we will reconvene at the end of this, uh, of this uh, session for a live Q&A with Prabhakar. So thank you, and Pierre-Antoine, if you can uh, roll it. Thanks, Yoel, for that very kind introduction. You know, the other day, I found several CDs in my desk drawer, proceedings of some past web conferences I've attended. Now, I've been going to these long enough that you might think that some of these should be cassette tapes. But it's great to be back at this conference, which has long been an intellectual home for me. It's been a remarkable experience for me going from the lab to the operational reality of search engines with a myriad of pressures and policies pulling in different directions. My hope today is to give you a flavor of some of these challenges while also highlighting the research questions they generate, many of which straddle computer science and the worlds of the social sciences, law, and policy. Naturally, most of my examples are Google-based, but I believe these are challenges and lessons for our whole industry. I'll cover six topics today. I'll begin by reviewing the state of the web, something of deep interest to all of us, and will relate to it some of my later topics around information quality, privacy, and advertising. Next, I'll get to the core topic of information quality in a search engine, dwelling on some of the policies and practices that we at Google and other search engines must consider. From there, I'll proceed to a discussion of how user needs have evolved over the years from web pages to entities to actions, the role of user state in search, and the societal benefits of aggregated and anonymized user data. This naturally leads to my fourth topic around privacy and advertising. I'll be discussing ads on the open web as well as on search engines. I'll then paint a picture of how new technology and new user expectations feed off each other 
to reimagine what it means to search. And I'll end with a brief discussion of early work on sustainability for the planet. This conference and my talk are both focused on the web, so it behooves us to begin by taking stock of the state of the web. Let's look at the numbers, recognizing that many of these figures are approximate because of variations in exactly how you define active hosts, web pages, et cetera. Netcraft and many other sources all point to roughly the same trend. Content from the open web, far from growing at the frenetic exponential pace that many of you will recall from early web conferences, has plateaued. Now, there's a reason I say open web because it's not as if people have ceased to create new content. It's that much of this new content that's being created is in what I'll call walled gardens, services that aren't accessible unless you establish a direct relationship with that service, typically with some form of login and authentication. They're also not crawlable to the degree you can on the open web. Concurrently, users increasingly access content on their phones through apps tied to these wall gardens. And the plot in this slide reflects a typical mix of browser versus app usage changing in recent years. While this graph is specific to the US, we know that app usage is even more pervasive in many countries like China and India. Taken together, these trends call into question how much of the world's information is universally accessible. It's helpful to understand what's underlying these trends. If you're a content creator, you can, on the one hand, put up a website. If you choose this route, you have to find a hosting service, pick authoring tools, maintain your website, worry about how your website gets found. Not perhaps a full-time sysadmin job, but it's not something a creative writer, artist, a small business owner typically wants to spend their time on. This is especially significant because content creators are no longer a select minority who undergo specialist training. Anyone can be and is a content creator. Witness, for instance, the rise of several social networks with billions of users who can quickly become creators, reach and influence other users, and go on to monetize their contributions. Unlike on the open web, the HTML web. These creators don't need to understand digital advertising, cookie settings, or web analytics. Instead, they can focus on creating content and gaining influence. However, their content is not crawlable, and thereby not contributing to or accessible on the open web. All that said, I do believe, and by your very attendance at this conference, I suspect you all believe, that a healthy open web is good for information access. You see, the web's ubiquity, standardization, and most importantly, its support for all voices, regardless of who creates the content and what they're saying, are fundamental to free expression. This is what makes the web the greatest societal artifact since the printing press. Recognizing this, I pose my first open question. What incentive alignment increases web content? Notice that this content benefits users, but any solution must address creators. I want to turn now to a different aspect of the web, specifically web content scarcity in most locales. On this slide, you'll see one view of internet hosts by country, recognizing that there's some imperfection in precisely defining a host as say France versus US, especially in domains such as .com that aren't tied to specific countries. Even with these approximations, it should be clear that hosts aren't distributed in proportion to say, populations. To underscore my point, here's some data by language. And while some of the top entries may not surprise you, it should be pretty striking how far down you have to go to find some very widely spoken languages. Chinese and Arabic rank way down with small single digit percentages of content and you'll find Hindi, spoken by over 10% of humanity, tucked away down between Slovak and Bokmal. Even counting people who speak English as a foreign language, it has between two and three times as many speakers as Arabic or Hindi, but there's nearly 20 times as much English content as Arabic and 100 times more English content than Hindi content. 
The graph you see on this slide is very rough for scale and illustrative only, but you can clearly see the imbalance. Now, one reason that languages like Hindi are underrepresented in web content is that the digitization of these locales jumped directly to content in walled gardens and surfaced in mobile apps. So speakers of these languages often have more phones than desktop computers. But this paucity of web content means that their users lack access to open information specific to their location and locales. And so this brings me to my next set of research questions. I recognize that there's a reason that most papers at this and other conferences do their research in English and not, say, Bahasa Indonesian. It's a shortage of corpus data. But if you're truly to accomplish the mission of empowering all humans with information, we need to solve these problems together. So my next task of this research community is to increase focus on translating the most informative English web content to underrepresented languages. Notice that this is potentially easier than solve machine translation. We're only asking that we machine translate from, say, English Wikipedia to underserved languages. This would already address a large swath of information needs in underserved languages and open up information to far more users. Now, some of you may have better intuition about machine translation than I do and suggest that this restricted translation problem might be no easier than general bi-directional translation. Well, this may be true. We all know that progress in empirical sciences is driven by the metrics we choose. So, if we focus on metrics for translating English Wikipedia to Arabic or Bahasa Indonesian, I assure you that we'll accelerate progress in serving these languages. The next question I'll pose to you, absent a full high fidelity translation from English, how can we better summarize content from English into an underserved language? Again, say from English Wikipedia. Is this problem easier than full one-way translation? How do you measure the quality of such a summary, especially without the context of a query? We could, of course, introduce a query context. Can we take a query in an underserved language, such as the Bengali query, who was the first Bangladeshi to win a Nobel Prize, and extract the answer from English and translate just the answer? The flow you see on this slide is promising, but does not represent an actual algorithm. The step from Bengali question to the English question is manually translated into the example. The rest uses machine translation. I'll wrap up this section by pointing out that the question I posed earlier on incentive alignment for the open web is of particular importance for languages with content scarcity. So I would especially urge researchers to focus on the needs and habits of users in these locales when thinking about increasing web content in underserved languages. The next part of my talk has to do with the core notion of what makes a search engine good, the quality of information it provides. During this discussion, I'll share the key policies and practices underlying Google search, as well as questions around what it means to address disinformation and misinformation. Let's begin with the classical view of how a search engine works the basis of most published research. The literature at this conference and others is rich in developing methods for crawling, ranking, and serving web search results. The diagram here is over 15 years old and comes from my textbook with Manning and Schutze. This is not what I'll focus on today. What I'll focus on instead is how these algorithms and systems interact with policies. When one of my colleagues comes up with a new idea for scoring and ranking, or a new feature on the Google search results page, how do we decide whether or not to launch the new idea? By a feature, I mean something other than ranked web pages, such as directly displaying the weather on a weather query, or answering natural language questions. Each year, we triage and launch thousands of such ideas. I'm going to share with you Google's approach to deciding such launch questions, in part to dispel a number of myths about what's going on behind the scenes, whether it's benign myths such as page rank is the formula for Google's ranking, or pernicious myths such as Google's ranking is skewed by the political beliefs of its engineers, which is simply false. 
The idea is to let a large collection of raters, in our case drawn from over 10,000 raters all over the world, decide whether a proposed change improves the quality of results as users would perceive it. These raters are trained to assess search results for their usefulness using a set of guidelines that we publish. You can always see the current version of the guidelines at this URL or find them using the search I'm showing. Raters are explicitly instructed that ratings should not be based on their personal opinions, religious beliefs, or political views. In fact, we at Google don't know their personal beliefs and views. This slide shows a sample page from our rater guidelines, currently over 170 pages long. But if you boil it down, the role is to ensure Google is returning relevant results from the most reliable sources available. Raters are our proxy for the users we serve, and these guidelines are the North Star by which we assess any change. If a new treatment gets positive aggregate ratings relative to the control, that is strong evidence that we should launch this new idea. Such evidence is then combined with other factors like the results of live experiments and latency impact to make a decision whether to launch or not. By intent, this removes the control of launches from the whims of individual employees at Google, myself included, leaving the evolution of our search experience in the dependable hands of empiricism driven by raters with clear and public guidelines. So consider checking these public guidelines and deciding for yourself whether there's cause to be concerned. Of course, the, the real magic and in innovation lies in the ideas for improving ranking or new search features. But the decision of whether an idea makes sense comes down to user benefit as determined by our raters and experiments. Now, everything I've said so far and a lot of what you'll see in the literature on web search looks at aggregate metrics, whether from rater assessments or other quality measurements. But behavioral scientists have said for some time now that users don't always react to the average quality of a service or experience. For instance, Fredrickson and Kahneman's peak end rule says that users heavily weight their most intense experience, whether positive or negative, and their most recent experience with the service. Thus, users are likely to remember and react to the worst experience with a search engine. So as we design our systems, we need to constantly work to ensure that a user's worst experience isn't a failure, and that we demonstrate we made the best attempt to provide quality information, else user trust suffers. This brings me to disinformation and misinformation on the web. Years ago at this conference, when you heard talks about web spam, such spam was usually economic in motivation. Almost anyone looking at such economic spam would agree that it's spam, and it led to a host of text and graph-based methods to handle such spam. But the more recent concern has been disinformation and the spread of misinformation, where the underlying motivation is to shape public opinion and policy or the outcomes of democratic processes. Challenge with misinformation is to assess a piece of content relative to the ground truth. Are there space aliens being held at a secret base in Nevada? Were ballot boxes stolen in a particular election? While we do serve all results matching a query, such as are space aliens kept in Nevada, because there are web pages matching this query and the user is asking for them, we don't try to determine the correctness of every assertion in every search result because our indexes do not contain primary ground truth on space aliens or the fate of election ballot boxes. Before discussing exactly how we address this and misinformation, let me take a moment to develop the underlying principle. We believe that society works best when people have access to a wide variety of content from many sources. Occasionally, results might contain content that some, including Google or its employees, find objectionable or offensive but we do not remove such content from the search index except in accordance with publicly stated policies or legal obligations. On this slide, you'll see a few examples of content that might be removed from our search results. And if you actually click down on the page, you'll see the detail. Let's take personal information that creates significant risk of financial fraud. If a victim of identity theft 
discovers links to websites that contain their personally identifiable data in our search results, they can alert us to that violation of our policies. Not only would we take action on the web pages that contravene our policies, but we'd also use this to improve our algorithms to try to prevent future violations and protect other users. Even though we sometimes take manual action to remove policy violating content, Google never uses human curation to rearrange the results on a page. Instead, we have humans review cases of policy violating content and act to block this content because it violates published policy. Your reaction to that might be great, but why can't you dis declare disinformation or misinformation to be a policy violation? The web contains established facts like the answer to the question, is Mongolia bigger than Kazakhstan? But it also contains opinion. We can surface facts, but it's not Google's place to determine whether an opinion is right or wrong. How do we tell whether we are dealing with fact or opinion? We cannot really. So we rely on expert consensus. If historically authoritative sources tell us that Kazakhstan is larger than Mongolia, we give that as an answer. If authoritative web sources do not support or deny that space aliens are kept captive in Nevada, as far as our algorithms can tell, we do not give a definitive resolution to this question, even though we return blue links of matching results. So we therefore rely on a simple principle. Historically reliable sources tend not to be sources of misinformation. That's why we build our ranking systems to surface high quality and reliable content at the top of our search results, protecting against harmful conspiracy content and potential misinformation. But there's more we can do. Many of you have found yourselves needing to verify a claim or check a source. To this end, Google tries to annotate every search result with helpful context before you even visit the web page, like a description of the site, whether your connection is secure, and other insights like what the site says about itself, what others are saying about it, and so on. This annotation is currently available in English, and we're rolling it out both to other locales, as well as adding more such information literacy metadata to each search result. In certain queries, we go further, especially when rumors are spreading faster than information from reliable sources. We put up warnings on our search results, indicating that results are changing quickly, and traditionally reliable sources may not have content on the topic, admitting and even highlighting that we may not have dependable information in our indexes. This is in keeping with the principle I shared earlier. Rather than have our employees decide whether something is misinformation, we use algorithms to fl flag situations where users might want to take extra care in assessing the reliability of information for themselves based on the best meta information we provide. This brings me to a fascinating research question in language understanding. Can we algorithmically attribute an assertion in a web page to another piece of content? Even being able to follow a chronological sequence of antecedents can be useful in understanding where an assertion originated. These examples demonstrate the importance of policies that a search engine puts in place, as distinct from its algorithms or features. Of course, a search engine and its policies must respect lawful order wherever it operates. If the web has a piece of content and a user is explicitly looking for it, we give it to them, unless prohibited by the law or the content policies I discussed earlier. Likewise, we have specific policies for the search suggestions you see when you begin to type a Google search. These are also public. It's critical that a search engine operates under a robust, compact, and durable set of policies and principles because providing objective, high-quality information at scale cannot be subject to the whims of individuals, spiky geopolitical events, or scrambling to invent policy on the fly. This is not to say we never create new policies or change existing policies. New circumstances do sometimes warrant changes, but these well-reasoned policy changes should be an exception rather than the norm. We believe that policy should be public, explainable, and consistently applied. For my next section, let me begin with a highly abbreviated history of web search. 
Web search early on was entirely about entering keywords and retrieving a ranked list of URLs. Some 15 years ago, the major search engines already recognized that users were interested in entities, not keywords. You see, virtually all queries contain a noun or a noun phrase. Users were looking for comprehensive information about these noun entities, people, institutions, movies, monuments, not just web pages about them. Search engines responded by collecting information about each entity, matching a query with a known entity, and delivering a comprehensive package covering all facets of the entity, like the name, date of birth, current occupation, etc., for a famous person. These collections became known as knowledge graphs and are built by many organizations, including ones you may not think of as web search engines, such as Apple and Amazon. This is a screenshot from an iPhone and shows a result from Apple's knowledge graph, which is called Siri knowledge. Increasingly, users' expectations are evolving beyond noun entities. They seek assistance in getting things done, in acting on the information they find. Once they find information or a movie or a video, they want to watch it or even queue directly to a specific segment. In this example, the user wants to change a car tire and we find a video satisfying their need. But beyond that, we're able to algorithmically analyze the video and parse it down to a series of steps together with the exact moment in the video showing each step, whether loosening the wheel nuts or raising the jack. This is also reflected in users' growing expectations of assistant services such as Amazon's Alexa, Google Assistant, and Apple's Siri. So the first evolution in user expectations was from keyword to entity queries. We're now witnessing another shift from entities to actions. This demands a corresponding shift in how search engines operate. At Google, the vast majority of the time, your past searches do not impact how your results are ranked. When they do, it's in service of providing the most relevant and useful results. For example, if you sign into your Google account and search for what to watch to get a movie recommendation, your version of the what to watch unit could be different than if I did the same search. That might be because I've searched for documentaries before, whereas your past searches have been for romantic comedies. Again, though, personalization like this is rare. In most cases, people doing the same query in the same place at the same time will get the same results. It's not that we think there's anything wrong with personalization. We want to build experiences where personalization makes a significantly positive difference. For instance, there are certain categories like fashion or beauty where people might want to see ideas more tailored for them. And for longer running journeys, like making a large purchase or planning a trip, people might want to pick up where they left off. However, it's possible there's a trade-off between the granularity of state and the user's perception of being tracked. That's to say, without understanding what's happening or why, it might feel creepy for a search engine to know that I prefer clothes designed for taller people, or I'm currently looking to book a hotel since I just booked a flight. It's critical that we get this right because the questions that users ask search engines can be deeply personal about health, sexual orientation, political beliefs, and much more. Our systems are designed intentionally not to infer sensitive characteristics like race, religion, or political party. Beyond that, users control what search activity is used to improve their search experience. Further exploration of these concepts demands that we surface to the user what state and user data is being used. This is a balance that we we'll need to get right because if we are not nuanced about these issues, we risk throwing out the good with the bad. So let's talk about this. The idea of user data is often misunderstood. Of course, user data makes many of the products and services you use every day more helpful like Google Maps using your location to provide you with directions. But there's an argument that any use of data beyond addressing a user's immediate need is problematic. This risks giving up great societal benefit. We just saw that location data is critical to get you from point A to B, but then when aggregated, it also makes new types of useful information available for everyone. Let me give you three examples. The screenshot on the left 
shows real-time traffic on Google Maps to help you get to your destination quickly. This is made possible thanks to aggregated location trends from millions of drivers around the world. The middle example likewise computes live busyness so that you know whether a park or a restaurant is crowded right now. This has proved to be especially beneficial during the COVID pandemic, allowing users to avoid crowded locations to better social distance. And the example on the right applies this to predicting public transit crowds so you can see how crowded your bus, train, or subway is likely to be based on past rides. All these examples showcase societally beneficial features enabled by user data without compromising the privacy of any user. When we think about how data is used and users' perceptions of being tracked, it's natural to think about advertising. So I want to talk about digital advertising, first in the context of privacy, but also because it's crucial to the existence of the open web and for merchants and advertisers to reach users when they have commercial intent. A few minutes ago, when I said search was largely stateless, some of you might have been perplexed. You might have thought, when I Google something, I start to see ads for the thing I searched following me around the web wherever I go. So that proves that Google has tracked me and is selling my queries to advertisers and publishers. But perhaps a natural line of thinking, this inference is completely false, but it does require some technical examination of what actually is and isn't going on. Let me start by sharing unequivocally what does not happen. Google never sells personal search data like a user's queries. Let's say you search on Google for some addresses, click to a retailer's website from the results, and arrive in the addresses section. Based on the fact that you came there from Google, the retailer could infer that you searched for something to do with dresses, not say sports equipment. But we never share your search history or personal queries with retailers, publishers, or advertisers. And even within Google, access to search history is highly restricted and handled very carefully. And while your search query might be used to serve your relevant ad above the search results, it's not used for ads you see on non-Google sites. Here's why it might seem like ads are following you around the web. When you click on a search result and go to a landing page like the dress retailer, that landing page will typically record your visit in a cookie on your browser. When this cookie is placed by someone other than the website, say by an ad provider, we call it a third-party cookie. When you subsequently go to another website, say a news article, you might see ads for dresses next to the article because the cookie in your browser tells the news website's ad provider that you've shown interest in dresses. These ads may be served by any of many display ad providers, including a different part of Google that is not the search engine, but you're not using a search query. Most major search engines, in fact, operate in exactly this fashion. They're not selling your query to an ad provider. Some browsers have already begun phasing out third-party cookies, declaring them to be an annoyance and intrusion of privacy. Well, there are many distasteful experiences that result from the wanton use of third-party cookies. The impact of eliminating them is more nuanced. Relevant display ads are more likely to be clicked, so eliminating such cookies is a hit to the ad revenues of news and other publishers. Their alternative is to show less relevant display ads next to their articles. This in turn has them showing more ads, which worsens the user's experience, leading to lower future user engagement. So publishers are naturally concerned with the elimination of third-party cookies, which they point out as a threat to the open web, something we discussed earlier. Recognizing this, Google's Chrome browser, which is operated as an open source browser independent of our search engine, has taken a more deliberate approach. Chrome has announced that rather than allow cookies that record exactly which websites your visit, browser has visited, it will digest the websites you visited into a coarse-grained set of topics of potential interest to you. If done right, a publisher can use these topics to summon ads on topics relevant to the user instead of bombarding them with lots of irrelevant ads. This is work in progress, and the W3C is closely involved as Chrome tries to balance the 
interests of users seeking privacy and the need to preserve publishers on the open web. Now, any such technical compromise needs to be surfaced to users with transparency and users need the control to opt out of such topic digests. These twin pillars of transparency and control are fundamental to privacy safe advertising. Chrome's support for such topic-based advertising is one approach to mitigating users' concerns with third-party tracking. And we expect this to be a rich area for future technical development. There are several fascinating research questions here, including the right way to even define privacy. I'll highlight one. How might we audit or verify privacy practices? For example, if a system claims to use differential privacy, it's hard to verify from its output whether it does so correctly. We said a moment ago that browsers are deprecating third-party cookies so that nobody can track and record every website you visit. Unfortunately, there have been attempts to circumvent this without using cookies. One such deplorable practice is known as device fingerprinting. Some players in the ads industry capture hash digests of a user's device, your phone, laptop, or even your router, to track you across websites and target you with ads. Thus, your device fingerprint was seen at an airline website, and then you see the airline's ads wherever you use that device. As a result, for instance, you may even see ads triggered by someone in your household visiting a website. Again, this is not Google sharing a query with a website or their ad provider. It's likely a fingerprint of your router. Unlike cookies or topics, fingerprinting is done without transparency to the user or opt-out control for the user. The resulting ad experiences are creepy to users and give the web a bad reputation. Google is committed to never use fingerprinting to target ads or to measure ad effectiveness. Instead, we're pursuing technical solutions to prevent fingerprinting because it damages users' trust in the web. I want to complete the discussion of advertising by turning to the ads that you see on your search results page, so the so-called search ads, as opposed to the display ads we've been discussing until now. When you enter a commercial query, you might see ads above the search results related to the query. At Google, the number of these text ads can be anywhere from zero to, in a small minority of cases, four, depending on how commercial the query is. In this example, you see two text ads above the web search results. The selection and ordering of search ads is done by complex algorithms, but behind the scenes, is some fascinating auction theory, the subject of many papers at this conference series. I want you to envision millions of potential ads in our database. We need to figure out which ads, if any, to show in a query and the order in which to show them all in about 200 milliseconds from when a query hits our front end to the ads being ready to serve. Now, each advertiser tags their ad with the query or queries for which they want their ad to be shown, along with the bid, which is the maximum amount they're willing to pay if they get a click on their ad. The collection of bids from all advertisers for a query naturally creates a real-time auction, one that is run on every single query since bids change in real time, Thus, Google runs billions of these auctions each day. An advertiser pays Google nothing unless a user clicks on their ad. We thus have two factors. How well does an ad match the query at hand? And how much did the advertiser bid for that query? How do we use these two factors to select and position the ads for a given query? And how much should we charge the advertiser if they get a click? Now, you might assume the search engine's goal is simple. Pick a set of ads to maximize revenue. But search ad auctions are an extreme form of what game theorists call a repeated game. Showing too many ads or low quality ads might help you get more revenue from a single query, but in the long term, can lead to ad blindness or disengagement. Hornhold et al. established the importance of focusing on the long term by developing a quantitative notion of ad blindness. This graph shows the effect of an experiment to increase ad load. We see a short-term increase in revenue shown in red, but when consistently showing more ads to a fixed group of users, 
revenue gains in blue on the slide quickly decay due to user disengagement. Google's search ad system accordingly embeds the notion of ad rank, which injects a user value component into an ad's score in the auction. Some ads may not be selected in the auction, regardless of how high they bid, if they are not high quality and relevant to the query. Well, ad rank is an important first step, a definitive mathematical model of long-term user value remains elusive. For instance, a user shopping for a coffee machine gets some value from good information that helps them pick a specific model, then more value from clicking on a merchant's ad that leads to a smooth purchase experience, still more value if the machine arrives intact and on time than it works as advertised and delights the user with a tasty cup of coffee, and even more so if many cups of coffee later, the machine hasn't broken down. While a search engine has visibility into the first step or two in this journey, the latter steps are hard to capture in a model. So this naturally raises the question, how can we better model long-term user value in the ad's objective function so that the ads shown are the ones most likely to lead to long-term user satisfaction? I'll end this section by highlighting the emergent role of randomization as a powerful tool in helping us design search ad auctions. This is a subject that has long been close to my heart and highlights how ideas from one field, in this case, algorithm design, a topic in computer science, can materially change another field, namely auction theory, a topic from microeconomics. In the simplest variant, imagine that for each ad in the auction, we add a random variable to the bid for that ad before the auction is run. Randomized auctions are of more than theoretical interest. They can be very practical for ad auctions. A fine art auction where you bid for a 30% chance to win a painting might feel unintuitive, but winning 30 out of 100 ad auctions on a class of queries is very natural and becomes a way for an advertiser to govern the spending of their ad budget. Google and others now offer tools to advertisers that allow them to express their goals in ways that are intuitive to them, such as a goal to drive visits to their website, e-commerce purchases, etc. When advertisers use these so-called auto-bidding tools, especially adopted by small businesses, randomized auctions can increase efficiency beyond the celebrated VCG auction, as shown in a paper that will be presented at this conference the day after tomorrow. So I'll end this section by posing another question. Can we use randomization to help us design better auctions which balance user satisfaction, advertiser diversity, and achieve a healthier ads ecosystem overall? I'll now discuss how changing user expectations coupled with new technology are helping us reimagine the search experience. I mentioned earlier that in many locales, digitization leapfrogged personal computers and went directly to mobile devices. This in turn has led to a large and growing swath of users for whom a keyboard is not the primary mode of input. We're seeing locales where speech queries are five to 10 times higher than in locales like North America or Europe. Spoken queries have a different distribution than type queries because users with speech input formulate their queries differently. This was recognized as early as Schalquick et al. in 2010, and Ido Guy's work published at Sigaya 2016 has a comprehensive comparison of speech to type queries. Thus, ranking algorithms optimized for typing type queries may not necessarily be optimized for spoken queries. In many widely spoken languages, continuous speech word error rates are still in the double digits of percentages. Thus, a long spoken query is likely to have one or more misrecognized terms, especially in a noisy environment like a street. This leads to the question, how do we adapt retrieval and ranking to the imperfect recognition of spoken queries? Do we need to go from a poorly recognized spoken query to an error corrected query and then retrieve and rank or is there a more direct way to go from noisy speech queries to good results? One interesting data point comes from Hum to Search, a feature Google launched a year ago, where you can hum, whistle, or sing a melody and have Google find the song. If you're like me, 
your humming is at best off key, and yet Google is able to retrieve matching results. On the heels of increasing speech input, we're also seeing growth in querying by image, whether it's screenshot in a user's phone or directly from the camera. We first launched this as Google Lens. It can now recognize 15 billion objects up from 1 billion a couple of years ago. We've now brought lens capability directly into the search bar where users can search by keywords, camera, or microphone. Taken together, these trends suggest that users are becoming comfortable with a range of input modalities. And the next frontier is the combination of these modalities. You may have seen a demo some months ago by my colleague Pandu Nayak, who pointed his camera at his bicycle and entered the query, how do I fix this? Searching with multimodal inputs, which we call multi-search, it opens up exciting new ways for users to engage naturally with the search engine, such as just as you might point at an object and ask a friend about it. Under the hood, we require indexing methods that combine different forms of content, text, speech, images, and video, into representations that capture proximity between all of this content. We also need efficient retrieval from such representations, and this raises a host of research questions. I close this section with one. Does mixed mode indexing lead to better language understanding by some measure? In my final section, I'll address a topic that we all need to think about. How can information access enable a more sustainable future for our planet? Providing search results of high quality is a critical part of this, but there's more we can do. On the screen, you'll see two examples, the first from Google Maps and the second from Google Flights. In the Maps example on the left, the user seeking driving directions is presented with a route that's computed to be the most fuel efficient if it doesn't happen to be already the quickest. Of course, the user has the choice of switching to the quickest route. This raises an interesting research question. How do users react? And more importantly, what is the, the imputable environmental impact? On the right is the flights example. We list for each flight option an estimate of the CO2 emission impact. Our testing found that when users see the CO2 impact of their flight options, they're more likely to avoid flights with higher emissions. These two examples, and hopefully many more instances that we'll all design, lead to a common set of research questions. How does one assess the environmental outcomes resulting from such presentations of information? All right, so I've covered a number of technical and ecosystem challenges around the web and web search including several questions that I'm fascinated by and encourage you all to explore. Let me finish by summarizing the lessons I'm learning in my transition from the lab to the engine room. Universal access to information has the power to transform lives around the world and with it uplift billions of people and to help create a more sustainable future for our planet. Preserving and growing such access presents hard technical, policy, and societal challenges that demand the best ideas and research we all need to collectively solve. And it goes far beyond finding a better ranking algorithm or user interface. In all these challenges, at Google, we focus on serving the user. And if you've been counting, I've used the word user over 100 times already in this talk, and I'm not done. Whether you're a search engine researcher or a policymaker or a user, I hope this talk has increased your understanding of some of the subtle trade-offs and the difficult choices in providing a web search service. We're committed to deepening the understanding of these issues and learning with you all so that social attitudes, research, laws, and policies evolve to preserve the enormous public good at stake in access to open web information. Next, I hope I've made the case that this and misinformation while a critical problem for us all to solve, is far more than just a matter of building a better spam classifier. Fundamental issues of open information access are at stake here, and we need deliberate and principled reasoning to strike the right balance. 
While advertising is the economic engine behind the open web, much work remains to ensure that advertising preserves user privacy. And a lot of this is technical progress coupled with robust standards and enforcement. Finally, technology and user expectations evolve in parallel. New technology sets new expectations and new expectations demand new technology. This virtual cycle will require us to continually study and understand users while looking for innovation in everything from hardware and user interfaces to machine learning and language understanding. Some 25 years ago, I remember asking at a conference keynote, if you had all the computing cycles in the world, could you build a better search engine? I'm now convinced that the answer is no, not really, because the quest for information is a fundamental human need that is not computationally bound. It's bound, bound by our imagination in what people want to learn and how we can meet that demand. I look forward to continuing this never ending quest with all of you. Thank you all. And I want to thank many incredible colleagues who have helped me develop this keynote. Thank you. And back to you, Yoel, for questions now. Thank you so much, Rebecca. You know, I know this field and I still like keep learning uh, no matter what. So let's jump into questions. Uh, we have not, you know, quite a few questions and not so many, so much time. Uh, so let me pick one here, uh, going toward the beginning of your, of your, of your talk. So we have uh, Frédéric Laforest who asked about uh, your part about Rater's assessment. So the question is basically, what do you do when the Rater's assessment contradicts the automatic metrics from your experiments? What do you, how, how do you make the decision? How do you make the call to launch or not launch a feature? It's a great question, Frederick. Uh, it's clear you were paying very close attention to exactly how this is done. And indeed, it does happen sometimes on some proposed launches that the, the raters uh, disagree with the live experiments. And this question is even more subtle because live experiments actually can take some time to bake, if I may say so, uh, because users' immediate reaction to a new treatment uh, can then mature over time. So uh, we do a couple of things. Uh, we sometimes rerun our rater experiment, uh, rater session, uh, but we also run live experiments for longer to see if users are reacting over time in a manner different from what we initially saw. Uh, if it's truly inconclusive, we won't launch. We look for generally strong evidence uh, that uh, that uh, comes from more rater guidelines uh, uh, evaluations as well as more live experiments before we decide to launch. Cool, That's super interesting, thank you. Um, another question now, uh, so let me check. So from uh, Alex uh, Christensen, um, so he's asking about uh, uh, whether Google makes the uh, entity list, for instance, the one you know, uh, coming from uh, schema.org available to the public or at least to researchers. And uh, whether, uh, let me continue reading, Google services such as web detection tend to change rapidly and without any indication of how and why, making it quite, okay, that will make it unreliable as a research tool. But let's start with the first part of, of the question. Are these entity lists that you talked about available to the community? Yeah, uh, Alex, uh, thanks for the great question. I'll try to answer it and, uh, uh, if it's incomplete, you can ping me separately and I'll try to answer better. Uh, so everything in schema.org and a related effort we have called data commons, which you find at datacommons.org is in fact publicly available. Uh, that said, I think what you may be referring to, uh, but forgive me if I'm not getting it right. Uh, what you may be referring to is that the knowledge graph that Google has built is, is a superset of all of the above. Uh, and some of those are derived from uh, extensive uh, NLU, natural language understanding and machine learning from a variety of sources. So that part is not made public, but everything in schema.org and datacommons.org is in fact uh, public. Um, another question, I'm scrolling here. Um, so there is a question from Naya. 
about uh, the federative learning of cohorts. So um, basically, Naya is asking whether Google is moving to, to flock this federative, federative learning of cohorts for better privacy than, uh, than uh, third party scripts or cookies. And also, if you can share what other privacy enhancements similar to flock uh, Google is working on. So thanks, Naya. Good question. Uh, so for those of you who don't have the context of Naya's question, uh, there is a body of machine learning called federated learning, uh, where you don't necessarily take every atom of data, but compose it into digests that are then used by other machine learning algorithms. Uh, and uh, early on, Google proposed using something called federated learning of cohorts, flock, as Naya says, uh, to try and move past third party cookies to deprecate third party cookies and move to this. Uh, based on developer feedback, uh, interactions with uh, many developers and the W3C, we instead uh, decided to, uh, we meaning Chrome, instead decided to move to the construct that I mentioned in the talk, which is the topics API. Namely, we take a user's browsing history, distill it into a small number of topics small enough that privacy is preserved, fat enough in some sense uh, that, uh, that there are many users in each uh, bucket. And in the process, we preserve privacy, but allowing third party cookies to be deprecated. Now this is work that the Chrome team has been working on with many developers and the ecosystem at large. And uh, it's fair to say that it's still not complete. It's under technical development, but we all want to get to a better state for the web as quickly as we can. So stay tuned. Uh, and uh, so in some sense, Flock was the original intellectual idea, but topics is the, the new construct. Cool, thank you. Thanks for being very efficient. So we have time for one minute, even maybe two more questions. So I okay. see a question from Sayed Begaye. Sorry, Sayed, I didn't pronounce your name right. So his question is about, uh, does mentioning the source of facts in the knowledge base, like you know, the Wikidata model helps helps with misinformation removal. Yeah. So this is a subtle question. So let's recap. Um, I think what Sayed is we're talking about is for each search result, we try to provide source information, metadata information, and we actually see a lot of engagement in that data, meaning a growing number of users actually checking where their information is coming, which I think is a great thing, right, uh, overall, okay? Now, remember, we do not remove anything unless it violates law or policy, right? So user can look at a, the, the source information, uh, what we call about this result, and decide for themselves whether to pursue going into that site and reading about it, right? But we will not remove it from the result. Uh, we will not deem it a result to be good or information or misinformation. Uh, unless it violates law or policy. What we'll always try to do is elevate authoritative content uh, as much as possible. And when we cannot find authoritative content on a subject like a rumor example I gave you, we put up a banner saying, hey, uh, we're not quite sure what's going on here. Okay, and the last question, I think, you know, I tried to squeeze as many questions as possible. So we have a, a question from Devarshi Kumar Sanya. So um, Devarshi is asking about semantic search. Uh, it seems to, uh, according to Devarshi, it seems to work better on the general Google search than on Google Scholar or Google News, like vertical search. And so uh, Devarshi is asking whether they use different algorithm or is it related to other factors like data sparsity while training the models? This one I could answer actually, but go ahead. You should answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, you know, the. It's very hard, first of all, uh, in, in a dynamic setting, uh, like any of the, the major uh, uh, internet services, including Google search, to speak to one algorithm. Uh, to give you a flavor for this, we, we every year we launch about 5,000 modifications. So this day, uh, my colleagues are busy launching on, on average 15 to 20 of them, right? So there is not a static thing. It's also the case that depending on query classes, different algorithms will get triggered. Right. So sometimes when you see things behaving in one way here and a different way there, it's because different subsystems are triggering. So, so you will see some of that. Uh, 
in general, uh, obviously we, uh, like our peer companies, are very motivated to work hard on every vertical to make it better. So to the extent that uh, any vertical is lagging, we'll absolutely jump on it uh, and, and address that. Uh, you all, I'm not sure that fully answers the, the question, but I, I hope I caught it correctly. Yes, yes, you did. Thank you so much. We are perfectly on time. I cannot thank you enough, Rebecca. It was enlightening and a, and a true pleasure. Uh, and this Thank concludes you. basically our Q&A session. Thanks uh, everyone, sorry we couldn't answer all of your questions. This is actually the, uh, the, the end of the today's uh, conference program. So it will resume tomorrow, Thursday at 8 a.m. Uh, CST. So we will, uh, we will be looking for you all to be online on Wobat tomorrow. Thanks again, Prabhaka, have a wonderful day. Thanks, au revoir. Au revoir.